Shut up and sit down. Hey guys, I'm Sai and welcome to X Podcast Nation. Here at the channel, you can find podcasts, interviews, content on a variety of subjects, including, but not limited to, mental health, football, films, TV, conspiracy theories, music, and much more. I've done several shows covering mental health, discussing various topics, including ADHD, depression, grief, addiction, with many more to come as we look to raise awareness and break down stigmas, educate people on the different aspects of mental health, as well as um, hopefully helping anyone we can on, along the way. Uh, we've got shows coming up on DID, bipolar and anxiety disorders, uh, featuring medical experts as well as people directly affected by these disorders and illnesses. Uh, one of the new series that I've been working on is Mental Health in Sport. Uh, episode 1 features performance psychologist Tracy Donachy. Episode 2, episode two sorry, featured uh, ex-professional footballer Willie Boland. Uh, today is another episode on that uh, in that series, uh, and basically in this series we just try to look at it from all perspectives and discuss the impacts and the pressures on or professional sport has on the mental health of athletes and teams involved. We're trying to speak to ath- former athletes, to medical prof- uh, professionals, journalists, hopefully some current and young and up and coming uh, athletes, just to explore the subject from all all points of view. Uh, with all that being said, I am uh, delighted to welcome back my first ever guest on Ace Podcast Nation, uh, who had previously previously appeared on episode one, which was entitled ADHD and Me. He's a mental health support worker, as well as works closely with footballers by heading the project named Recovery in Sport. Uh, I'm thrilled to have Jacob Kelly back on the show. Hey, buddy, and welcome back. Thanks for having me. Nice to be back. Yeah, it seems like ages ago, doesn't it? It was, yeah. uh, I then, like, coming up to 50 shows since. Wow. It's a bit mad. Like, yeah. I think this is this is something like number 40 or 41. So it's been flying by. But you've been there, you've been busy anyway. So, uh, obviously, what, what have you been up to in the last few months since we last? <laughs> Lack of sleep. So, uh, I think <laughs> last time we spoke, uh, we were, my wife's expecting, so we've had a uh, baby boy. Uh, and yeah, everything's going well with the baby and mum and all that. But yeah, it's just a killer. You just, uh, I think it's just a reminder how you quickly forget how difficult the sleep is. And you know, yeah, the first I think week we went through many packs of paracetamol. It just felt like a long hangover. But uh, it's settling now. It's not too bad. So if you hear any crying in the background, uh, it's uh, the baby. Yeah, my kids are pretty much like. My youngest is 10 now, and so it seems like another lifetime ago that uh, we had the babies and stuff. Like, my brother's just had a little baby not long ago. And, uh, yeah, you soon get into the pattern of not sleeping as well, though, I think. Like, yeah, it's, it's your crazy. Body just the adjusts, body so isn't it? it? So I was saying, like, the first couple of weeks, it's, yeah, it's pretty bad. But now, it's, yeah, it's, your body just gets so used to it. But it's weird because, like, obviously... Before the baby came, you would have had certain sleep patterns. And then obviously with your ADHD as well, you'd have had certain patterns about your day-to-day stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then the baby comes along and then everything goes out the window and everything changes. But then, like you say, within a week or two, it's as if you've been doing that all the time. Yeah, it's crazy. You can't really have a ru- like you can have a routine with sort of older babies, but yeah, with newborn they just don't. They, they just want to do what they want to do, uh, which is fine. I'm happy with that. <laughs> it's what, it always makes me laugh when, um, like, if we've got, like, friends or family or whatever who've recently had a kid and they say, oh, yeah, we'll be there at three. And we're just like, no, you won't. Yeah. Because, you know, if you've got, like, a baby under one, just as you're walking out the door, they'll need a nappy change or they'll yeah. need a baby, you know, a I bottle just, or they need feeding. Stuff, stuff, we both have, like, backpack each. Crams for the cars for uh, yeah, it's just crazy the amount of stuff you have to use and take with you. But uh, it's getting there. I think I was saying someone like the first year is just a whirlwind, really. So 
you don't want to wish away time because it's amazing when you're with them. But uh, first year, once that's over, I think it will settle down a bit more. Yeah, it's a it's a weird one because I always think that people generally they almost do like they don't wish away the time, but it's always they always seem like they're oh I can't wait till they're one mm. and they're doing this or they're potty trained or they're going to sleep yeah. on their own or they're you know they're on they're not breastfeeding anymore or you know whatever it may be. Yeah. And if I just especially now my kids are older. I, whenever anyone I speak to, anyone's got a baby. I just say, enjoy all the little yeah, things. Little like this. Enjoy waking up at three o'clock in the morning and like clutching your baby and just yeah, yeah. because it goes so quick. Well, then, my, like my oldest now, she's two and a half, and I, she just don't like cuddles. Like where like, <laughs> we were saying like a year ago, happy she would love cuddle and all that. But like now, she's like, no, nope, I'm a bit independent now. Don't need that. Mm-hmm. So, it shows, you know, and that's only two and a half years. So you, you've got to embrace it and take it when it comes, really. Yeah, my oldest is uh, coming up to 15, doing his GCSEs, and uh, barely wants to speak to me half times. <laughs> is what it is, I suppose. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the, this series is on a obvious podcast series which is specifically focused on mental health within sport, the pressures on professional athletes. Uh, on, you know, it can be on a daily basis, whether that be the pressure to be the best, the media limelight pressure, the injury, like injuries, or personal life and other pressures, which can have an effect, you know, on their 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 job as it is. Um, it's certainly, like I know people say, Footballers, they get paid thousands of pounds a week. What have they got to be depressed about? But like, and that's a surprisingly common comment that you'll see on, you know, social media and stuff like that. But like, you know, you got to let, let's be clear: mental health, illness, depression, whatever it may be, it does not discriminate, and it doesn't matter if you are rich, poor, white, black, whatever. It doesn't matter, female, male. It just does not matter. Uh, it can hit you at any time, even when things are going well. Um, so let's delve into it a bit. So um, obviously, when we did a podcast before, you were sort of on the brink of starting uh, a new type of project, but it wasn't underway. So, like, tell me, tell us, tell us about your work and your project that you're involved in at the moment. So, I suppose my day-to-day job, I work in a NHS mental health. Uh, community mental health team so daily I'll be visiting people at their homes supporting them with their recovery could be preventing them to go into hospital it could be sometimes hospital is the only option Uh, so I do that sort of crisis work as well as doing stuff like I support them into getting into work I could be working with employers if they've taken some time off work so I'll do some education with employers it could be stuff I run like activity groups so a lot of the people we work with a lot of the stuff they struggle with is anxiety the, the, getting them out there meeting other people that might have struggled with similar things is really powerful so this week we did a uh, Banksy Art Trail so I took a group of I think it's four or five of them out around Bristol and getting some exercise talking and all that and like those sort of things that's my sort of my experience and all my expertise has always been in running groups. Uh, so it's always something I've done throughout my career, working in mental health. And then before that, I used to do um, promotion in clubs. So I've always been a bit of a promoter, and either that's in mental health or in clubs or pubs and all that. Um, and so how I get, you know, I, I loved sport, I loved football, but I was never, you know, I had a team. But, I never thought, you know, five years ago, that is where I would want to end my career. I always thought it'd be in just general NHS. And then um, what happened, our locality, similar to like postcode areas, our sort of locality didn't fund any sports for mental health. Uh, And so we are young lads that wanted to do football, couldn't go to the, the Bristol, which is, you know, probably three miles down the road, their group because of their postcode um and after about a year i was like no this is not good enough uh so let's set up a little group for our little case so we had about four or five lads come in and it was good and i was like 
you know, I love a kickabout. I, you know, four or five is great, but you can't really, you know, we wanted it bigger. So we just said, you know, traditionally mental health group in teams, they'll run their group for their caseload and that'll be it. And what we did, we said, look, let's just open it up to anyone in or out of mental health services. Doesn't matter if you struggle with mental health or you don't. Uh, if you want to come play football, meet nice people, uh, build your well-being, this is the place for you. Uh, so we set up this group, got some initial funding at first. Uh, we linked up with our local uh, professional football team there, the Community Trust. So we linked up with them um, and then just started the ball rolling. And my view for things have always been, I think, I've always been like a working class boy. I've always said, you know, I've always wanted especially as a parent now I'm noticing it more like there's loads of great events for kids but they're already expensive and what events you know advertise what are targeted for people that maybe don't have that much money there's not many events a lot of events now for kids are quite expensive and so I was like you know I want it, I want anyone to be able to come doesn't matter if you're rich or poor if you've got no money we all help you out so the group's free we're able to give people free football boots um We've got a scheme where if they like come in but they struggle with transport, we'll, put, we'll pay to that they go on a course where they build a bicycle and then they can cycle to the group. So that they, we pay for all that, they get a free bike a lot. So that's how I got into sort of just sports. And then I thought, you know, my experience in working drug and alcohol where a lot of people share their experiences and are really helpful for new sort of members of 12-step uh, groups. I thought, you know, we don't really have that in mental health at that, at that time that people, especially sports people, were openly talking. So I wanted to have something slightly different about the group other than just being a normal football group. So that was inviting footballers or coaches with lived experience of mental health to come, run a session, then follow it by a and a where we would ask general questions about mental health. And uh, since doing that, I think that started getting my head sort of thinking and, and being around sort of professional footballers more because before I'd never been around a professional footballer mm. and seen that sort of side of football because in your head you'll be like oh it's great it's really glamorous you know I was really excited and it is exciting being around a professional footballer is exciting but I think you quickly learn actually it's not all that is you know there's some amazing bits about being a professional footballer um, but there's some really difficult bits and there's bits that they have to sacrifice and even, you know, even not even professional footballers, semi-pro players have to deal with quite a lot of stress. And I think if I didn't, especially because I work with a lot of employers with our normal caseload, if I said, you know, some of the situations I was hearing from professional players or coaches, some of the stuff that they've been through, I was like, in any other job, it just wouldn't happen. Why is this? behavior acceptable uh in football that these players you know i get it like we said earlier that they get paid a lot of money but some of the stuff they have to put up with you know i would rather not have the money uh and so once we started meeting players we had a few players come and we had chats with them and then uh from working with our local community trust we met more players and uh got a couple of the players to then join us uh, a little bit more and uh, yeah having those chats and we did a mental health evening where uh, yeah I'll talk about the story after in a minute but uh, yeah just meeting them I was like right there's some work to be done here because there's, there's clearly a lack of talking about mental health, a lack of support, a lack of knowledge um, and it's getting better now but I, I think that's it's something that I was really keen on to do more if that's in my work life or if it's in my personal life. Yeah, it's, um, do you know, it, I think I, like I played sort of football to a decent level to about 16, but I trained a lot with older kids and kids okay. who were in academies and we had those academy coaches and back then, so you're talking like the early 90s, mid 90s. The, the the way the coaches would treat and interact with teenage kids. It's, if I told, I'm not going to tell you the stories, but like it's frightening. Yeah, yeah. And like, I just think that these young men are 
taught almost to to not speak about their feelings and not or their emotions and their their mental health then it's almost like they're trained to keep it to themselves and just get on with it sort of thing and um <clears throat> i do think that like stuff like you're doing is you know it's obviously it's the it's the way forward yeah. um were you, were you met with like some reluctance i think from... at, at first i think um i think our, like we so our first for me the turning point was we did a mental health evening so i knew for our in my case load of people that were struggling the football group would always do well and get you know, getting the players persuading players to come and openly talk about their mental health has been a little bit difficult but i think um most players were so there's some players that are quite open that have, that have can't gone out and press and said they've struggled so they're quite easy but then players that haven't got haven't reported any mental health difficulty they'll go oh, i can't really talk about that in the q a and then you talk to them about things like you know how did you feel when you got released from that club and then they'll go oh yeah well, i felt i felt a bit low and i you know i wasn't leaving the house i was like do you a little bit depressed oh well yeah i suppose so or like you know they'll talk about it and i go you know that is mental health it might you might not need medication but it's well-being you know and i think everyone uh, is on that line of well-being some people will struggle you know a lot that they'll need maybe support and help and some people they're still on that continuum of needing support so i think that and then i think the turning point was we did this mental health evening where we had uh two ex-pros two current pros me uh the manager of the community trust and i think that was it on sort of like a uh on a table answering questions in the beginning we did like uh i think we did like q a and all the questions we planned most of the questions with a compare and we talked about mental health and then we did a quiz on mental health for the plan all the plans came we expected probably 40 people and i think we got just just under 200 fans and i think what the you know i knew i knew one of the players sorry, sorry mate That's my right. plug's in the kitchen mate yeah it's fine sorry jacob my That's phone i just I realized my phone is about to die uh, okay. so i was trying to negotiate my son to get my plug uh, sorry fine. go on carry on um, i was I listening knew, i was I just one of the players had spoken in an interview about his mental health the other two didn't know anything about them really and uh so I thought I was a bit like, oh, is this going to go well? And all the players were pretty open. You know, one player talked about his uh, struggles with addiction, with gambling. Um, mm. One of the ex uh, players, who's a pretty big legend at the club, had scored the winning goal to get him promoted. Uh, and he's now a coach at the club. He talked about actually how retirement was a big thing for him. You know, going from a professional player to now a retired player uh, was a massive thing. And he, he was really amazing he's really brave and he's like you know i'm really struggling now if i'm honest you know i've got a great job so he's he's uh coaching and he said you know most people think oh what was he got to moan about he's a professional player now he's a professional coach but he was like you know i, I can't watch the boys play you know it's a massive you know for, for me he said my like, family would come and watch me every week and now they don't you know and that, you know i've seen uh something a few players do interviews recently and they said you know it was that was their life for 10 years and then stop you know that was their day trip for their kids every saturday and now it's completely different so i think after that event you know i spoke to a lot of fans and i can't believe he talked about that i can't believe he's struggling with that and all the players you know the manager from the community trust was very open about his experiences and uh we did an exercise at the end where they said you know if you've been involved in mental health, if that's for yourself or a family member, stand up. And uh, I'd say 90% of the room stood up. And uh, everyone was like, you know, or I think it's a family member and friend. And actually, then you you see it visually. Actually, it does affect everyone. If that's a family member, a friend, a colleague, whatever. And I think that, for me, was the turning point then. And then we got the evidence from that uh, evening to then go, look, the more stuff we're doing, the actually easier it is to contact players, and and that got us sort of in the door with especially the two pros that had done the event. Uh, they knew us then, so it was easy for us to chat to them. 
uh, the ex pros. I think he just got us in the door of that event, really. Yeah, it's. Um, I think once with footballers, with, like I've spoken to a few now, um, you know, and one of them was my absolute like hero. Um, so to hear him sort of talk about some of the issues that you know footballers can have, and like I spoke to Willie Boland, who you know he got myself and my wife together um, oh, really? all those years, all those years ago, which is a great story for you know for a Cardiff fan. Um, but he discussed like the difficulties that he had upon retiring, and I think that's a you know you see obviously you see the big names like Merson and. Gaza and the people who are still struggling today, um, but to hear like I think they there's, there's lots of aspects to it upon retirement. Obviously, it's a short career. They they're used to that day to day camaraderie of being you know with their friends and playing football every day, and it's a big big difference. Um, so before we move on, like we will cover retirement a bit more in detail in a bit. Um, but it's just sticking with your sort of your work and your project at the moment. Um, what sort of things have you got planned going forward, like in place at the moment? So the plan, the football group will continue, and I think that helps the local community. The bread, you know, that's our bread and butter. And I think what our plan is, sort of this year, we just had a meeting today about doing a similar event. What we did, um, I can't talk about too much because they told me not to, but uh, yeah. A similar event that we do we did last year to raise awareness about mental health, but uh, it will be more of an education sort of evening for maybe uh, professionals. Is it, I can say professionals. Um, uh, so it will be more of an education evening. Uh, maybe, and it's not going to be really for the fans. It's going to be for professionals, maybe working with players. Um, that's probably as much as I can say. Um, but yeah, so that. But long-term goal, you know, I think there is, especially with my sort of NHS head on, I think, you know, I would love, you know, long-term to I know, set up some sort of charity or some sort of organisation that works with professional clubs uh, to offer mental health support and education to their coaches, players. But also, we're talking about giving mental health support to the players. So when they're injured, they're not just left to you know, rehab uh, in a different environment from the team. They meet with you know a support worker once a month or once every other week, whatever they need, just to have a supervision, checking with them, what's going on, how are you keeping yourself safe? Because you know injury is a massive, massive hit to a lot of people's careers. Um, but also offering that to academies, you know, saying you know, because I was saying this as a parent, I think. If my son was in the academy and the choice was out of A or B, both exactly the same sort of club, same sort of wages, but one offers mental health support. So if your son does get dropped or released, uh, you know, there's a care team that will see him three times just to talk about a plan. And for the clubs, I imagine most uh, owners would go, well, what's the point? We drop them, they're gone. You know, why should we spend money? I think it's about you've got to think it long-term and think, are parents going to be more likely to send their kids to a, a, a team that offers them that support? I think most parents probably would. Um, so, yeah, it's getting my foot more in the door. We, we want to work with more players. I have a little team of sort of, there's about three of us, one that can offer sort of uh, cognitive behavioural therapy to sort of them, uh, to players to work on those sort of things. And CBT, I imagine, would be amazing for professional footballers. I bet, you know, I, I can see their minds sort of working really well with it. Of, also offering families education or family support to the families. Because if your husband's, you know, out every day, probably eight till three, and then he gets an injury and he's at home for seven months, that's going to put pressure on the relationship. Uh, but also, if he's just been released and you've got your mortgage to pay, there's going to put pressure on the relationship. So doing more sort of what I do now, uh, you know, the dream job would be what I do now, but for, for, for professional athletes um, or professional footballers would be brilliant. So that's a long-term aim. Uh, but more sort of education, you know, we have to take it slow. So more education for players, doing stuff like this. I think uh, having more open conversations with coaches 
Uh, that's something I'm really keen on because I think the players are actually quite open to this about mental health more now. I think it's about talking about how the coaches and management team can support their players, how a club now needs to step in. Yeah, and I think, like you say, in many ways, um, I think uh, not, not just with your work, but overall, educating coaches, not just in football, in other sports, I think that's vital to sort of taking that next step yeah. in making sure that all players, young, you know, in, during their career and when they retire, have that sort of aftercare, if you like, of making sure that they've, you know, they've got the tools to be able to... And I think our uh, generation are more open about talking about, you know, I'm not being ageist, but I think our generation are more talk about talking about, open about talking about their emotions, how they're feeling. Uh, but... You know, I, I'm aware that the older generation are still quite, they struggle with more about talking about that. So it's definitely talking about mental health. And uh, and that's not all what people over sort of 40 or 50. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, managers and coaches I hear about that are of that age that are very like, nah, we didn't have mental health back in my day. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, those are the ones that need sort of targeting, but also educating the young ones to go, right, this is right. This is how you support your players. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. I um, you mentioned CBT there, so um, for people who are not aware, that CBT is a uh, cognitive behaviour therapy, um, and I've actually been having some myself for my own anxiety, um, and I I think I got like one session left, um, but I I agree. I think that for footballers and the way they need to think and the way the things they have to deal with and things like pressure and mm media limelight whatever it may be i think that that could be really beneficial um so what um what would you say are like some of the most common reasons that you might hear uh, a player sort of struggling or having some sort of mental health issues so a lot i've spoke to you know more recently you know i think it's and I've read you know, a few articles that have come out this week about players talking about injuries. Injuries is a big one, but also, you know, not getting your contract. So not, especially this time of the year, a lot of players out of contract. Um, and it's how you release a player if you just drop them, if they've been dropped from the first team squad in January and they're not, they know they're going to be dropped. Or, you know, there's a few articles I've read about players, you know, they've been there thinking they're going to stay there, they just get dropped. And it's not, you know, I, I some people are like, yeah, but they're footballers. But I explain it to them, I say, imagine if your boss come up to you and said, right, next week, you're not here no more. You, you need to get a new job. Uh, and it's not like uh, you could just apply for the next place next door. There's only sort of two employers in this city and the other one won't have you. So you're going to have to move to a different city. Uh, and that's probably about two hours drive from your kids. So your routine now has changed that you need to get a job very quickly to pay your mortgage, and you need to get a job probably about two hours, an hour of drive from your house. So that's going to affect your relationship, seeing your kids, seeing your wife, and that's going to put pressure on your relationship. If you said that to most people working their jobs, they'd be like, nah, I wouldn't have that, no mm -hmm. way. You know? And that's what football is like. You know, I've met a lot of players recently that have, you know, been released and they've just had to get jobs with teams that two hours drive. They now have to work out, you know, do they have to now buy, rent a flat in this city, stay there after the week and then come home, uh, which then means you don't see your family after the week. Uh, so the pressure is massive and, and that's just like getting released. That's just one topic, you know, getting an injury, you know, the pressure on, you know, if a club's bought you for a certain amount of money, you bought me, I've just got injured. I read something about, um, I watched a documentary actually last night about Jack Wiltshire and uh, it's sort of six minute documentary talking about injuries and well-being and stuff like that. And he talks about when he had quite a bad injury at Arsenal, he actually came home from, I think, a rehab uh, on his knee, I think it was, and uh, his son was having a fit. He said that wasn't reported in in the news and it, it, or in the press. None of the fans knew about that. But for I think for a couple of months, his son had regular fits, 
And uh, he said, yeah, that's going to affect. He said, I had to stay up all night just to make sure my son didn't fit because he mainly fitted at night. So that, you know, we're talking about the stresses of having a newborn baby. Imagine that as well as then a high, really high pressure job where people are, it's very open that they can tweet you and go, you're shit. Uh, you're oh, yeah. injured. Um, and so that's, you know, two topics there you've got being released and injured. Probably, I would say, for me, I'd say that those are the biggest ones I hear about um, or the man being out of favour of the manager. And, uh, you know, those two what topics, if you if you say it out in normal terms, you can see how it's going to really affect someone's well-being. Look, Jack Wiltshire, he's injured, he's not in work. So being out of work, your routine, that's going to affect your well-being. Lack of sleep, that's going to affect your well-being. Uh, it's going to start to affect how you process things. The guilt of, you know, not not being the man of house. Some people have those reasons or not not providing for their family um then the extra pressure of you know now people think i'm injured all those things when we explain it as i think i didn't know if i did it in the last part about the stress bucket so we also have my glass here so everyone has a stress bucket so mine could be a quite big one yours could be quite a small one and uh, every time we get stressed we fill that glass up with stress so it could be being released a bit of stress um wife having a go you a bit of stress lack of sleep all these things and if you and there's a, imagine you've got a little valve at the bottom and you turn that and that's relieving the stress so for me seeing my family relieves that stress so it brings the stress levels down or having a bath like something simple that can relieve their stress so the water's going down if you don't relieve those things by seeing family or doing things that you find that water fills up falls up and then it overflows and that's normally how we explain someone having a breakdown or becoming unwell and so you can see how it's very, you know, in the high pressure job of football, how I'm surprised. I, I think it probably has happened more than it's been reported. You know, with the, there's a few like big Premier League players that are Aaron Lennon went into hospital I think last year. I think there's more, but I think maybe not so much to go into hospital, but the base, you know, general mental health is in anxiety and depression. I think there's a lot of players day to day that are deal that are struggling with it, um, but it's just not being reported, or they're not able to speak to their managers because there's no mental health support in their club. You know, I think Premier League they've probably got it. Anything Championship maybe any thing down from the Championship have no mental health support in there. You know, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't heard of any League One, League Two. Uh, teams that offer mental health support for their players and it no no and it's crazy so, really. you think if you think of most employers now we work with loads of employers in my work uh tesco all the big employers everyone's now talking about well-being uh lack of you know poor well-being costs the economy a lot of money uh from people coming to work and not uh being able to do their job 100 percent. so i don't know why they're not having this chat in football uh I know Premier League, you know, for the money they've got, especially in, I know there's not money in League Two, but you know, if you've got money to hire analysis men and all that and spend 140 grand on turf, I'm sure, you know, just getting a counsellor in, you know. Yeah. I've, I've, I've spoke to my local club and I said, you know, I'd be willing to, as a trial, offer uh, support to some of the players for free just to trial it, just to get my foot in the door. Um, mm. and that hasn't been taken up yet so yeah I, do you know you were saying about the media I do feel like the media contribute massively to uh, the players feeling or potential feelings of like anxiety or depression mm. where they so often we see these clickbaity headlines which yeah. imply one thing about a player's form or his attitude or his personal life. Half the time it's either not true or the headline completely is different to what's in the article. But people see it and then I just you can see how that could easily build these these stories build up. Yeah. And then it's like you say, like a pressure cooker of just that constant feeling of of like stress. And then you go into work, and then that stress is making the form not very good and because I think you're, you're I think overstressed. 
it's very quick. Everyone forgets they've got families. And, yeah. you know, look at most of our friends and our, you know, all our couple friends and all that. You know, we'll have friends that their relationships end. You'll, we'll have friends in our circle that they have, mis- you know, their, their family, they try for a baby, they have miscarriages. You have one uh, friends that their kids might be really ill. They might be struggling with their own mental health, the kids. And that's just, you know, us as gen- general people. These professional players have all that, but they mm. don't, they're not given the sympathy of it because they're like, oh, you're getting paid loads of money. Um, so when someone's not performing on the on the pitch, they're like, oh, they're shit. Instead of thinking, and I know it's never going to change. Yeah, I'd love to think it's changed. I'd love to think that fans are going to go, oh, I wonder if he's getting, like, having a nice time at home if his missus isn't giving, like, something's not going on with his home life. It's like, Okay. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, if you hear some weird noises, we're just making a baby bottle. Uh, That's all right. Nice. But, um, yeah, so I can, you know, fans struggle with that sort of uh, thing. This is a professional player, player, but you've got to understand they've got a family. So if they're not performing, it's not just, oh, they're shit, and that's why they're not performing. It could have, have a thought. I wonder if everything's all right at home. I know it's quite hard for fans to think that because as a fan, you sort of feel like you've got ownership of these players. There are players until they leave. And it is a weird dynamics to think of that. Um, but just maybe even if you could just have that one thought or, you know, this player's played well for five years or four years and this season they're struggling a bit. Why is that? Is it because they're shit or rubbish? Uh, or is it because they're, you know, their family, you know, we didn't even talk about bereavement. So no. One of them could have a family member who's passed away. Um, and understanding in our normal jobs, for as normal people that aren't professional footballers, if our dad passes away, we're probably, you know, one of the, someone I work with, she had uh, six months off when one of her family members passed away. And that's fine. She was lucky she had that support that she need. you know, she needed six months off work to deal with, you know, all that stuff. If a professional player footballer said, right, my dad's passed away, you normally hear, like, oh, the club have given him the weekend off or something like that. I've never heard of longer than sort of a month. I don't think I've ever heard of a month. Uh, And so just, uh, you know, just understand that actually these are people, however much they get paid, mental health affects everyone. And life, even if it's not mental health, life affects people. So, uh, yeah, just bear that in mind, really. Couldn't have put it better myself. And, you know, on top of all those different aspects, they've also got the pressure of just the pressure from their coaches to to perform in training and the pressure to win games. And um, an interesting aspect, aspect that when I spoke to Willie Bowen Porter is that, when he came to Cardiff, he had like about a, his first season. He was struggling for form a bit, um, and he he felt like uh, after losing a game or having a bad performance, if he wanted to go out with his missus or something for a drink or go out with his friends into Cardiff Centre, he didn't feel like he could do that because he thought, or oh, if the you know the the South Wales Echo take a picture of him and he's out after they've lost they're going to paint it as he's got a bad attitude yeah. or he might run into fans who will be like, Oh, you were shit today. Yeah, why are yeah. you out? Why are you out drinking? Whereas that, you know, he's just like any normal person. He's got not game or he's not working the next day. So he's going out yeah. with his family. And, family. Like, yeah. I don't do it so much now. I've got kids, but like in the old days, when I had a bad day at work, but like, right. Let's have a pint at the pub. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so in the city I live in, there's two teams. It's a very big rivalry. I don't really get the rivalry. You know, I'm not... The team I support isn't a big one in the city. The community trust that works with me, I suppose I'm more of a fan of them. But uh, some of the, there's one player who's played for both teams. And I was like, I'd love to have him. He's, he's been great at both clubs. And a few people were like, don't, you know, you can't have him. And I was like, why? And it's more like the risk to the player. Uh, yeah. He said, if he was to come back to his old club and do an event, even if it was for people struggling with mental health, 
the amount of abuse you get off fans. Oh, I can imagine. You know, uh, he's left our club to go to the Traitor Club, and now he's coming back. Uh, you know, there's only one. There's one guy. He, he, he won a professional footballer. He was an actor, local actor, and he's a massive. Uh, I won't say the team's names, but uh, he was a massive red team, uh, mm. and our event is sort of supported by a blue team. And uh, he, I said to him, look, you're you're an actor. You've talked about your lived experience of mental health. Don't really care if you're a red or a blue. I want you to come to the event. He's a massive football fan. And he's the same as me. He is a huge Red fan. Uh, and he said, I will get stick for this, but mental health is more important than if you're blue or blue or red. And I completely agree. I said, you know, I don't want you to get stick. And he did get a bit of stick even from some of our lads. But mm. uh, fair play to him. He came along and uh, he actually, the funny story is he came along full red kit. He's an actor, man. He's not a professional footballer. Full red kit, everything, brand new. And uh, a friend of his is uh, the kit man for the red team. And he, once he found out he was coming to a blue event, he kitted him out. All red mm. kit, everything. But I said, you know, that sort of, that's the fun bit of it. I said, yeah. oh, I don't mind a bit of banter, but I think there's a line where players are getting abused and they can, you know, if a player can't do a mental health event, helping people that struggle with mental health because they're going to get abused for it. What what sort of what are we sort of doing with our country? Like, what yeah. everything, you know? What's going on? I, d- I don't get it. But I get on the other side. Football is a massive thing that some people are very passionate about. And for me, I need to. I know my view isn't as strong as some people, but some people. There's a guy I work with who's uh, he's a massive red, and he cannot wear the uniform of the blue. You know, I wear the blue coaching kit. And uh, he can't wear it. He said, I can't. I just can't physically put it on. And I, at first, I thought, that's ridiculous. Uh, but for him, it's like a religion. It's like uh, me asking him to put a burqa on if he's, if he's a certain different religion or me asking him to, you know, change his views on, or politics. I, someone said to me, it's like me asking if he's a really strict Labour supporter and then me asking him to go to a Conservative rally or wear a mm. Conservative badge. Um, so I get, you know, there are fans that are diehard fans that for them, that is, you know, that player massively disrespected the club and all that. But I think it's important for us to take a step back and go, these are human beings. And, yeah, of course. You know, have a bit of sense and go, right, let's, you know, because I would love to do an event with both teams of the city. Uh, but I'm aware that that wouldn't, some, some areas of the fans would really not appreciate that. And, we talked about doing a mental health event and some fans were really were quite open to that. And then some fans had said, you know, if you get two both sides together, there might be a fight. You know, I don't know if that would actually happen, but I think if, if we're even having that conversation, you, think, you know, what fans going at it at a mental health event? What's that? What are we doing? So two things I would say. First of all, I wouldn't wear a Swansea City kit. Yeah. If you if you paid me, I thought you were a Swansea of... fan now. <laughs> Piss off. <laughs> Piss off. So I wouldn't wear the kit for Swansea. I wouldn't wear Swansea's kit. Full stop. However, say who can I think of? I'm trying to think of like a Swansea player who I ex- dislike incredibly. I know Lee Trundle. Okay, say he came. And he was doing like a mental health talk in Cardiff. I would encourage it and speak to him, and I'd want to do yeah. anything I could to help her because I just think like, and I think I gotta be honest, like you see when there's like um, like tragedies or things that happen within football, yeah, the the, the core football fans will always come together regardless yeah. of team and stuff. You know, you're gonna you maybe you get like a few idiots here and there but like i generally think that most people would see it as you know mental health bigger yeah than, yeah and than that's that. what we're trying to do because i think you know i've been to a few games more you know i used to go to games loads as younger but uh i went to one recently and one of the players that we do doing a lot of work with uh just 
you know, he's helped us out massively. Uh, so he was playing, and he's, a, you know, big. A lot of team uh, fans love this player. So I was like, oh, yeah. Just go and shout his name. And uh, five minutes in, he miskicks the ball straight away. The fans are in fact, you're you fucking break mm. it. And I think because I knew him personally, and I've been to a game in a while, it's like. The, what's going on here? And uh, a friend of mine stood next to me who goes to a lot, a lot of games. Uh, he was like, "Yeah, that's what it's like." And I said, "Yeah, but they love him, don't they?" And they were like, "Yeah, but they just—that's what all fans are like. They're on, on them all the time." And I said, "No." And I spoke to the player after. I said, "What do you think to that? Like, you know, they will be singing your name, and then if you mess up, they'll be calling you everything. But then they say they love you after." He said, you know, honestly, at the beginning, when he was youth, he used to take it on board. But now, his sort of brain sort of just developed this sort of, he just doesn't even process it now. He doesn't even, like, listen to it. Um, but it must be hard because I think, you know, like we're saying, in your day-to-day job, if your boss was, if you're walking around the office, then people, go, every time you mess up, everyone's on your back straight away. You know, it must be really difficult. It's so difficult. Like you say, if you did, if your day to day job, you had someone just telling you, "Oh, you're you're doing crap today," yeah, yeah. constantly, it would get you. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to circle back to something which you mentioned. I think it was right at the start about semi professional players. Yeah. So one of the interesting aspects, which I think with the semi professional players, is a lot of them train and play for their club, but they've also got like a nine to five job. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, like a, they work on a building site or they work in an office or whatever it may be. So they're, in a, they're doing two jobs as well as playing football in the hope that, you know, a lot of them are hoping that they'll get that sort of full-time contract. Yeah, yeah. But again, though that extra sort of, that can have an extra strain and extra Absolutely. pressure. And we work, you know, we work with our one of our local semi-pro teams. And since working with them, I think, I think some of their... You know, some of the fans have been, you know, once the club said, oh, we're working with the NHS mental health trust, I think the fans have been more like, oh, oh I struggle with my mental health and a bit more open. But um, I'm planning to to build my sort of experience as well. I'm going to do my coaching badge, I think, this year. But I'm going to spend a couple of sessions at the coaching session that for the next season with the team. Hopefully, I'm going to try and keep my mouth shut, but you know me, I like to talk. But I think... Mm-hmm. Just listen to how they deal with the players. Um, I'd love to go to like support the coaching staff. Like I spoke to the manager, so he's a good friend of me. And if I didn't have a baby, I would love to be on the coach, even like volunteer, just to sort of see what they're doing to get that experience of being around. But I spoke to a few semi-pro players, and yeah, they've got this, the stress of a full-time job. It's funny actually. We've spoken to a lot of young semi-pro players that are looking you know there's a lot of older ones that know they're not going to get that contract but it's more just for the bit of extra money they love football but it's the young ones that probably could can go on to professional they're playing for their professional team um chatting to some of them you know it's very different their experience to then chat to the older ones about what it was like when they were younger that you sort of said about some of the stuff that these older coaches used to say probably 90s 2000s to these young players one one of my uh, friends who's, who's very good uh, manager now, semi protein he was saying when he was a young player, like the stuff that the manager, you know, if you were dropped that week, they wouldn't say, right, unfortunately we're not going to pick you this week because we're going for more defense. Like that. They're like, you're, sh- you, you're dropped, mate. You're not even coming with us. Mm-hmm. I've heard stories of players being dropped off, like not being told not you're not even getting on the bus. Um, and these aren't adults. These are kids. Like, if yeah. we did this to a kid, they would be uproar. So why are we letting our coaches do it to our young players? Uh, and I think as a parent, when you hand your son or daughter over to a, a football team or a cricket team, whatever, you expect them to be looked after like they would in any other sort of social group or whatever. Like but uh, here are some of the stories. I know there's loads of stuff going out about abuse, but just... You know, with sexual abuse, but even just like emotional abuse, the stuff that these these young players, especially at semi pro, I think I seen it with um, oh, what was it the Salford City uh, when they did their documentary about Salford, uh, the class of '96 
starting up and now obviously they're in league two i think but uh the first episode of the series they had these two managers that were mouthy and i as a as a fan and viewer i was like probably before i knew as much as i do now i was like oh it's quite insane it yeah but if your family's watching that tv show and they're seeing some old man going you're fucking shit you are that and all your family it's embarrassing but also i think what is he gonna how is that gonna make him play anymore like i think the days of the hair dry like treatment is gone if you look yeah. at the most successful manager uh but well, most successful for player well-being look at your club his players love him what is what is he doing that other managers aren't i think his players the players he's got there's some amazing world-class players but there's players like I mean, funny james milner i don't think is a world-class player but he's managed to get the best out of james milner uh and henderson that you know if we were saying five years ago henderson and james milner would be playing in the last two um champions League finals you'd be like that so what is he doing that is very is different i think what he does is he loves his players like family but also he appreciates them and he's putting that arm around them and what and I think that is, not all managers will do that, but I think that's having an openness to say you can struggle. You you know, I imagine if I was a Liverpool player and I was struggling personally with home life or a family who passed away, I think you'd be a pretty good manager to support me. Uh, and so why is, you know, what is that model he's doing? And why are managers, it's clearly successful because players want to play for him. If you look at the end of the Champions League game, uh, all the players, and even since, the players like um, Shaqiri, was, uh, there's a rumour about him leaving. He was like, no, why would I leave? You know, I've been, they've been the last two. But also, I feel like I'm really looked after here. Uh, the staff looked after. So it's about, yeah, I think, I think that's the way to go, to be honest. I think in, in 30 years' time, I think, I'd like to think that they just sing and have these dinosaur managers and coaches around. I think if you look at coaches like, so I got to work with a coach called Ben Ghana. Uh, not many people will know him, but he's, his story is pretty, you know, if you look at his credentials, unbelievable. Um, how he hasn't got a first team management job uh, in in the sort of, in the leagues, I don't know. I think it's because he doesn't have that experience professionally as a professional player. But he's, you know, he's worked with people like um, Mourinho. He's worked in the Premier League for Crystal Palace and West Brom. But his way of thinking is very good. His way of coaching is unbelievable. And he's, you know, he did some work where he talked about, you know, he was a professional player, quite young, wasn't, you know, great. But he was in his living uh and i don't know if he could have made pro but uh he got injured and then he spiraled after that you know things went downhill and then coaching and football got him back out of that and i think this is you know how many how many managers you know that would be that open to talk about that not many i think he's he's someone i would love to see get a good job somewhere and i think once he gets his job in the english league you'll see Play, more managers like that coming out because his craft is unbelievable. Uh, I know he was in, I think it was in, I don't know if he went to Middlesbrough the last couple of seasons ago, but he's worked with some amazing managers and uh, a lot of the players uh, that have worked with him, uh, you know, they've all come out. And if you Google Ben Ghana, there'll be a lot of stories of players talking about how great he is. Yeah, and I think. It's interesting that you say that because I was speaking to some um, children's football coaches about a month ago and um, I was speaking to them about the, the change in direction of how coaching was 10, 15 years ago and how they are with kids and very much, particularly at academy level for young kids now, there seems to be a better understanding of every kid's got a different personality, every yeah. kid responds differently different yeah. things some have got adhd some haven't some you know have got anxiety yeah. even at a young age they worry about things they need a bit more you know encouragement whatever it may be and i think as an adult if you've got a team in an office or a team on a football pitch that's what you would do if you're the manager or the team leader 
you understand that everybody is different. In, and some, and different. some players will react better to the hair dryer treatment than others. Me, personally, as a staff member, my boss come up to me and start shouting at me. I, I wouldn't really, it wouldn't, that's not what I want. I want my manager to back me. And if I've done something wrong, pull me aside. If I've done something good, tell me. But then, let me do my job, but also I want you know the manager I've got now is amazing. She she gets she sees she knows about my AHD and she uses me for what I'm good at, what I'm not good at. She doesn't use me that much for, her. Mm-hmm. but also she protects me. She looks after me. She yeah. knows I'm a family man, and uh, she will do my like with maternity leave and paternity leave and all that. She's been amazing with my ADHD. She's been amazing. I think. Um, and I'm very different to say someone, a lot of the other people in the office. So she's very good at going, right, this is what I need to do with Jacob. This is what I need to do with this person and tailoring it. And I think it's the same for management, like you were saying. Each, you, each player will have a different style and a very different personality. And a good manager, good coach can see that and get the best out of the players. I yeah, think oh, the ones that struggle, the ones that want to, it's not molding their form, but molding their beliefs I, I think you can believe you can mold your beliefs on like this is how the style of football but general personal beliefs are not going to change you know i'm not going to change my view on politics if, if someone tells me to i'm not going to change my views on is that right or wrong it's on if a manager tells me to uh so our core beliefs you just can't change that you know those are that's what makes us who we are yeah, and I think like if you look at the way um, Mourinho was at uh, Man United, mm. he was in the press criticizing people like Luke Shaw, you yeah. know, really, really cutting criticism. Not like, oh, he's out of form, but I know he'll come good. Yeah, really yeah. cutting, quite nasty stuff, and it this undercurrent of sort of negativity was developing in the public eye. And you can only imagine some of those, you know, some of those players are like 19, 20. Yeah. They must have been thinking, you know, I know he's got this big long list of trophies won. But I mean, they wouldn't be human if they yeah. weren't feeling yeah, down yeah. and, and like, depressed so, and anxious and struggling Luke with that atmosphere. Board, if Luke Shaw, Luke Shaw went to the board and went, right, I feel like I'm being bullied in the workplace, they'd be like, I do all mate. Where like in a yeah. normal job, like we're saying again, I know football is not a normal job to say, but they are human beings, and we need to understand that. It doesn't matter what job you do, we have to treat people with respect. And I think, you know, it, if my boss was then slagging me off to, uh, not you know, there's no way even con- it's not just slagging you off to your colleagues. It's slagging you off to the community, the community mm-hmm. you live in, saying Jacob's rubbish at his job telling all your neighbours, because that's what Mourinho was doing, doing it so publicly that everyone knew. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, absolutely. Go home, his wife, it's not just his neighbours, it's his wife's, you know, his wife's friends, his kids, his, I don't know he's got kids, but his kids' friends, or oh, my dad says you're all rubbish, and all that, like, it's, yeah. It's like never-ending, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's murder. So go, Um, I want, just to finish off, then, I want to go back to the, like, retiring players. Obviously, there's been some like high profile stuff with Gaza again recently. Um, and we, in my show with Andy Campbell, um, he's from the same part of England, like Northeast. He's from Middlesbrough and Gaza's from Newcastle. But like he played with him when he was a youngster and he sort of described, you know, what he was like, like a lovely guy and he would help you and he was funny. But like he was quite upset because he had put a tweet out saying, you know, someone please, you know, reach out to him, try and help Gaza. And people were like, oh, no, he's he's had enough chances. He's, he doesn't want help. And it's like, and Andy Campbell said, like he said, and I agreed, is that it's never too late until it's too late. And let's not get to the point where it's too late. Yeah, so, like, and what we're saying have- as a generation, uh, as a country, as a community, that, right, let's give up on them. Let's just give up on people. They've had enough. And I know it's, you know, this, you know, drug, drug and alcohol abuse is, you know, it's not, for families, it is a killer. It is, you know, it is really difficult. Uh, and I've worked with many families that have been affected by drugs and alcohol. 
uh, and it's really difficult. But you've always got, you know, especially in our my job, we always got to hold hope. There's people that uh, will always cancel appointments with me, and if I was to go, nah, that's it. They've had their chance. Uh, I wouldn't be doing my job right. And our job is to hold hope. So I think it's about doing that as a and going right. Yeah. You know, what you say about retired players? If you know, I, I always say, oh, I'd love to retire at 30, 35. Mm. That actually, uh, the you know, the idea of it is nice, but the actual, you know, that you, you cannot do your job at say thirty-nine or forty. What something that you've spent all your life doing? What are you now going to do? Because if you're, you know, Premier League, yeah, I could maybe go into, you know, entertainment, TV, and all that. If you're a championship below, how much? I can't imagine many Sky, BT Sport are going to want, you know, are going to go, oh, do we know that guy who played in League Two for, for five seasons? I've never heard of him. Um, and those are the players, you know, League One and Two, those are the players that retire. You know, what are they doing? Like, and what support is out there? Uh, and that's a massive, you know, it's just, like I said, you don't have a job that you're regularly going up to and you're 40 years old and you go, well, I've got another six, potentially another 40 years left in me. What am I going to do? You know, what am I going to do for, for the next 40 years? Uh, and that's a massive, you know, and also some of these lads might not have paid off their mortgage. You would hope they would, but some of them might not have. Um, and so uh, I was going to uh, say, um, so that when I spoke to uh, Tracy, the performance psychologist, um, she felt that one of the things that they really need to bring in for young players, like those players, as soon as they're made professional, then they are they're getting effectively, you know, in most a lot of cases in the Premier League, a year's wage for a normal person in a yeah. week. Yeah, they need to be having some sort of support, which teaches them how to budget, pay right. bills, and put money away. Because yeah. these kids, they come out of school, they, they play, fo- play football, play football, then suddenly they've just got loads of money. Yeah. They've always lived at home. They've never been you know, paying bills and mortgages and putting away money for when they retire. So she felt that that was a really important thing. So my last question for you is going to be... Um, what sorts of things can the FA, PFA, football clubs put in place to help players when they retire? However, before you say what you think, I'm going to just say some of the things that I think would be a good idea. Yeah. So I think that I think that coaching badges in when you get to, say, 30 should be compulsory just to give them something to focus on as they're winding down their career and then it's an option if they want to do it they don't have to do it it's something which can keep them busy um keep them involved in the game um i also think that given the clubs should give the players um like media training get prepare them so they can go into like punditry or tv presenting but also maybe help them get some bookings on Match of the Day or BBC Radio or Talk Sport or whatever and actually help them get a foot in the door from that front. Because if you've got players who were, you know, they might be quite shy. And if they haven't got the contacts at Talk Sport or BBC to, to get those opportunities, then they, I know they've got agents and things like that, but I feel like that's a good way that they can find something straight away when they retire, something which they're comfortable with something which they can, you know, they can really get stuck into. Also, um, helping them if they want to do some education, a degree or something, you know, encourage those sorts of things. So when they finish, they've got, you know, something to focus on and something to help them not feel like their world's ended because they haven't got that day-to-day football anymore. Yeah. Obviously, encourage, encourage them to work, whether it's helping in the communities they grew up in, because obviously, you know, a lot of footballers come from quite working class or poor communities. Um, so, like, doing stuff within those communities to improve, uh, you know, improve conditions for young kids there, opening academies, or helping people like yourself 
with like mental health and helping mm. educate younger players, I feel like the clubs could really do put if they had those things in place, it's a good start. So okay, and I, and the other thing was the thing about the budget, like helping them manage their money yeah. when they're eighteen, nineteen, twenty, when they get their first proper contract. And they go from like the apprenticeship money to the, you know, to the money. And I mean, even in like League One, you know, a really good League One player can earn like a thousand pound a week. Which, mm. you know, I know that's not Premier League money, but that's still four grand, four grand a month. And if they're just blowing it by going out with their mates and you know whatever it may be, showing off because they're you know they're with their mates and they got a lot, lot of money. Yeah, it could they can easily spend four grand in a month. Yeah. And then if they get a bad injury, their career is over at 22, mm-hmm. and they haven't got any of that four grand a month yeah. to to fall back on. Um, yeah, so go on. I think it's that. I think some of the so I've met with a few young fresh players, and some pretty switched on from sort of 18, 19. They're looking at what am I going to do at the end of my career. So some they put their money into housing, renting and like buying properties. But then getting that what are you gonna do if you what are you gonna do if you retire at thirty five? What are you gonna do if you get an injury and you you have to retire at twenty one? Having a plan. So as soon as you get into a professional contract, there is a plan that all clubs have some sort of you know, we had it at school like a employment person that says what do you want it to be when you're growing up. But maybe someone that goes in and goes, Right, what are you guys doing? With your, do, do you have a savings? Is, you, what are you doing? You're more like a financial advisor, but mm. not just finances. They're talking about what is your plan? You know, yeah. if you want to go coaching, you need to start doing your badges now. If you want to go into TV, you need to start doing a media training now. Um, so someone in the club, embedded in the club, or in the PFA, I don't know if they have that, but uh, something that play, play, any player from any league can go to. It's not just Premier League or League. Yeah, or yeah. That would be good, I think. Um, having having mental health support, I, I read something about uh, the PFA. They're, they're expecting their, the support they give to players this year to double or treble in the numbers uh, that they had in the previous year. So I think the figure for the whole of 2018 was 438 players that they had helped uh, and that had risen 160 uh, from 2016. So having more mental health support in the clubs, I know some PFA are looking at it, but more embedded in the clubs for retired players, for current players, for when, you know, when they retire, actually someone keeping an eye on them and going, you know, you're right, what's, you know, like this player was saying about earlier, I don't know if he had anyone from the club sort of saying, checking in with him or the PFA. I imagine they weren't, but um, other than his family. So I think the support when you retire, it's got to be around their well-being. Are they looked after? But also putting things in place, of what are you going to do with the rest of your career? Is it going to be, you know, there's only enough jobs in TV. So is it going to be property? Is it going to be education? Is it going to be a, a seeing one player from League Two is just set up his own mental health well-being college? You know, what is it that? What's your passion? If someone said to me today, right, you're sacked. We're going to give you, or you're going to be sacked in ten years. What other job do you want? You know, I'd start thinking about that now. Right, I'm all right at landscape gardening. Maybe I have to set up a business for that. You know. Because if I have to, you know, a lot of these lads, they might have to pay their mortgage off. So I'm going to have to get some money in somehow to start having that conversation really early and just have an open conversation about it. Um, but then, so yeah, having the conversation, the extra support around budgeting, what you're going to do when you retire, if, is that now, if that's now or in 10 years' time, and having ongoing support for the players that are, you know, for when they do retire, if you know, someone's checking in with them. Yeah, I like the idea of um, of the young players being taught uh, right. What are you going to do if you you know if you have a cruciate knee injury next week yeah. or next year, and you could never play football again? Have you put money aside? Have you got a plan? Yeah. It's almost like that. That encourage them to carry on. Ed, you know, go into education. Yeah, so yeah. Like they're nine. 
they're 19, they might be playing first team football in the championship or whatever. They're getting good money, but they could go and do, you know, a degree or go to university part time, just something. So then, yeah. if that worst comes to worst and they get a bad injury, they don't feel like their world's just imploded. Yeah. Um, and like you say, if they're embedded in the club, and I think one thing I do think is if clubs have got a counsellor or a mental health support worker or even, you know, like a reverend or a chaplain yeah. or whatever, just someone where the players can go, but they need to know that it's not like a tattletale to the manager. Yeah, yeah. yeah it needs exactly. to be like a, you know, like... And that's what I've always said about the mental health team. You know, if we... Because I always thought that, like, if we had that in, you know, our local club, would the players feel comfortable to talk about it? And I think saying, right... This our conversation, same that we have it at our work supervision. Yeah, it stays you and me. It's a private yeah. conversation. Um, and I know that we, you know, if there's any uh, professional footballers listening to this, they might go, clubs ain't going to pay for that. They got no money. They can't even pay, like pay for a brand new stadium. Yeah, club. Some clubs will not be able to pay for a full time mental health support worker, but clubs can contact. All the local organisations, there's loads of mental health organisations within every city that will be a mental health organisation or charity. If you said to them, would you be able to offer education to our football club for free? I imagine all of them would say yes. If you spoke to uh, a finance, a financial advising company and said, right, does your company want to be the, the sponsored finance, uh, financial advisors for you know, our local team? It's great marketing for you. All you have to do is offer financial advice to our players for free. Most financial advisors will take that. You know, if the brand of their team is big enough, they'll take it. So, yeah, I've flagged loads of free stuff uh, over the years using contact. If clubs have literally got no money, there's loads, you know, there's, especially with mental health, there's loads of staff that are willing to offer their time for free or support uh, in any way they can because they will like helping people, you know. So if you've got no money, use partnerships, make these partnerships, these connections, you know. Yeah, I think it's just being open and going, you know, I seen one football club, they sent something out on their Twitter, or oh, we've linked with this dental practice. Well, they've linked with that, so they probably sent that tweet out, great advertisement for the practice, and they're getting a discount for that. So why are they not doing it with the mental health organization spot on mate and that's it isn't it? if these clubs contacted local mental health charities and trusts yeah 99.9% of them would be willing to send someone yeah even if it's just a, for a one off yeah I'm for sure a trial they're... period or once every couple of weeks you know yeah. it's it's a bit frustrating from that aspect of it yeah um, so you know mate obviously mental health is a tricky subject um, and I do feel like as a nation and people, world, whatever you want to call it, we are moving in the right direction when it comes to mental health um, and mental health within the sporting community as well. But they, you know, there's still plenty to do. Um, and there's, you know, you do hear still some horror stories of mm. the way people have been treated or the way people have been feeling. Um, and like I said to you before, I really do hope that this you know, discussing these issues on podcasts, having guests like yourself on who are doing, like, tremendous work to improve things. We can get more people on board with the stuff that you're doing. And I've always said with the mental health shows, it's like, if one person watches one of my shows and thinks, oh, I'm going to go and talk to someone, then I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. Because definitely. I know what it's like to be, like, at the bottom of a bottle and yeah, feel yeah. like I don't want to go on. Yeah. So, but we were saying about this before show, you know, if anyone thinks that's a good idea or that's a rubbish idea or I want more information on that, tweet me. Tweet me on at ADHD Father UK. I'm always happy to chat with people. I've spoke to people on the phone sometimes. You know, I remember uh, my mum saying to me, is a number of this guy struggling with ADHD? Can you just talk to him about what you found out for? And if I can, I will. Uh, if someone, if there's a f- footballer that goes, actually, I love the idea of your project, I want to help out, 
get in contact with us. But I think it's just about getting that conversation going and being open and going, you know, the reason I work in mental health is because, I, you know, I struggle with my ADHD. A family member of mine had mental health difficulties. And I think that was, the, that was for me, it was personal. But I think now I'm, I'm involved in it. It's about helping out my local community and, you know, the people I work with and the people I, you know, I want the best for the community. And if that's helping people, that's what I want to do, really. Excellent. I'll um, I'll drop all the links to Jacob's projects and websites and Twitter page, everything. I'll put them on the screen at the end, but I'll also drop them in the description for the video. Um, obviously, you just gave your Twitter uh, handle. Is there any other links or Twitter accounts you want to tell the people about? Um, I think we spoke. There's. Uh, I think it's just looking. You know, if your PF, if the PFA you feel is not doing enough you know, and you're a professional player and you want support for your own mental health, you know, there's loads of charities in cities and stuff like that in your city. If you don't know, Google it. If you want to help out your local community and you're a professional footballer or you're just a fan, you know, each uh, club in the Football League will have a community trust. You can get involved with your community trust there. They do a lot of great work. Uh, or speak to you know your mental health provider or your charity if you want to help out. You know the project we run is not funded by the NHS at all. All the money we get from it is from grants that we have to apply for. Uh, our team have not money. You know we are we're having a next activity group as a picnic. The staff are having to pay for the food for that out of their own money because there's no money in the NHS to do that. So the only way we can get away with not doing that is fundraising. Uh, so yeah, there's loads of things you can get get involved with, you know, if, wherever you live in England. There's loads of mental health projects that you can help out with. We've got one guy who volunteers every week, coaches with us. So yeah, get involved and uh, help. Absolutely. So lastly, I would just like to finish off by saying um, to anyone who might be struggling, um, just please take it day by day. Don't give up. Reach out to someone. Anyone, you can talk to me. I, I, my DMs are open always, yeah, and I'm great. happy to I'm happy to talk. And I know Jacob is as well. Um, and speaking about it is half the battle. Mm. That first, when you when you've bottled the bottle something up for a long period of time, and things are getting on top of you, that first conversation about oh, I'm struggling. I think I need help, or I need to talk about it, or whatever. You know that first step is is a huge weight off your shoulders and that is really is half the battle um okay so yeah you can find jacob at adhd father uk yeah. um, you can find us uh at twitter is uh, at acecast underscore nation you can find us on facebook.com acecast nation um check out the video formats of all our shows on youtube and audio formats, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, all those sites. Join our growing community on social media. And uh, thank you again, Jacob, for coming on. I really appreciate it, mate. Thanks for and, me. uh, It's been good to catch up and chat again. And uh, we'll see you guys later. Shut up and sit down. Shut up and sit down.